So, thank you and welcome to CanadiveCon. I'm happy to be here, I'm happy to welcome you all, and thanks a lot, Evan, for this great introduction and the look into Canadive. Now we want to go a little bit in the other direction and, would, uh, and look like and see how Canadive fits into the broader landscape of serverless and fast, land, uh, fast platforms, actually. But before I start, I want to clarify what I do mean with serverless and fast. You probably know that serverless and fast are probably one of the two terms which are the most diffuse and overused buzzwords over the last decade, I would say. So my definition for serverless and fast is like that serverless is a deployment platform that abstracts away the infrastructure, while fast or function as a service is a programming model which runs on top of serverless. So please keep that in mind while I'm presenting the, the next slides because I might intermix both of them. So now let's, let's see a little bit what happened in the last 15 years about um, serverless and fast. So therefore my... Uh, there we go. So this is a timeline. So let's start around 2008. And I would, would like to, to uh, separate this in kind of... Uh, uh, here we go. In kind of epoch. So we start with something which I call pre-fast or something like that. So this is kind of the uh, transition from platform to other ones. And um, see some of Okay, these are all, these selections that I'm going to show you is kind of my personal thing. So this is an opinionated approach, how I timeline in the history of serverless and fast. But you see that AWS Beanstalk and Google App Engine were first kind of way how you could throw over your code to the cloud and then run it somehow, right? So these offerings are really old. So I was quite surprised that they are that old. <laughs> They still exist today, of course, but probably in a different format, so in different uh, shape. But now let's switch over to the, to the next epoch, and then, of course, there are the Big Bang in 2014 with AWS Lambda. So Lambda came in, and actually Lambda was a scripting extension for S3 buckets, so that you can hook in your business code when something changes in a bucket like that. But then it turned out that this kind of glue code is really very, very useful to connect services together. And this and the success of AWS Lambda really came also with this whole set of services that are around of, uh, and that Lambda could connect to them. And in, in the wake of uh, AWS Lambda, there are a lot of other stuff has been emerged and uh, so there has been some tooling like serverless, serverless framework, which uh, adds a nice user experience on top of AWS and also other platforms, but AWS Lambda is one of the, the, the most prominent ones. And then also some indication for the success, of course, that a lot of the competition competitors of in the hyperscaler space also created functions offerings a little bit later. So this is a really be created quite fast after AWS Lambda. And the problem actually is not that, there are, that you have the choice now that you can really choose the platform that you want to run your functions on. It's just that they are all kind of proprietary formats. So functions, as I said, is a programming model, so it defines a function signature. And uh, these are kind of all different offerings and they kind of compete. But if you stuck, select one, then you are stuck to the ecosystem and then also to the services that, that you want to connect. Of course, you can connect with the Google Cloud functions, also AWS services. But at the end, you kind of decide first which platform to use and then uh, you stick to that. So this was uh, the state of the art uh, at the beginning of 2018. And then, totally in parallel, a revolution happened, which is the race of Docker and the container. So Docker, I don't have to tell you about Docker, but Docker just remixes a set of existing Linux technologies together and adds on top of that a great This is my gist of, of Docker itself. And then we have Kubernetes then a little bit later in 2014. I also don't talk about Kubernetes, so <laughs> for sure. But you know, of course, actually adds on top of, of Docker and makes it for great orchestration stuff. So, so we have this, now these two streams of, of serverless offerings in the cloud, and then also Docker and Kubernetes. And, and uh, Docker really um, take, took over the IT world in Storm, so it became kind of the dominant deployment platform 
for your applications. And then, of course, people started to combine those. So, but even in the, in the, in the hyperscaler, they, the offerings were a little bit um, different and separated like that. For, but then, so what we see here, there were experiments. So OpenFast was the old first open source uh, framework that, that ran on, uh, on top of Kubernetes. But then there will also be some combinations like AWS Docker, which is introduced as a backend and gives you the impression of an infinite size Docker daemon, something like that. And the same is true for container instances. So it really abstracts away the infrastructure that, uh, in that case that you really think about that, that there's a Docker daemon, but you do not operate that. I hope you can still understand, despite the audio issues. Yeah, yeah. No worries. One, two, three. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. And now, uh, in 2018, we all know what happened. So uh, Evan already told us, Kinetic entered the stage and um, really try to provide an open source and also standardized um, experience for running containers in a serverless way. So. Okay, then um, of Kinetic, you know, has been initiated by Google, but has been backed by many vendors from the very beginning. So there was VMware, IBM, Red Hat, but the players in all those based some products on top of Kinetic. But the good thing is, and even these products are running as managed services, some of them, some are based on internal or any Kubernetes distributions like Reddit on. Okay. So, yeah, but the good thing is that if you run one application with Kinetic of, of one of these platforms, you can then move them on to another platform. Of course, the devil lies in the details. It's not automatically possible always, but at least it's much better than all the wallet gardens that you have seen before. So this is a great advance in uh, thing, and you see that there are really a lot of uh, joys that you have now and without having this vendor login that I've described. And also some kind of uh, indication of the success of Kinetic, of the commercial success of Kinetic is also that competitions and competitors that do not settle on Kinetic also offer some, something similar. So they, like for example, um, Asia Container Apps or AWS AppRunner, they all introduce also a simplified application deployment model, that, which makes Kinetic famous that it really ma makes easy to bring your application to the cloud as well as really a very sophisticated and capable auto-scaling mechanism. So all this is already happen, happened there. So again, this is where we stand now. No, not, not, not quite, because we have Kinetic 1.0 last year, and now we have also Kinetic Functions, because one of the biggest critics of, um, of Kinetic was that it's okay, it's a serverless deployment model, but where is this function, the programming model on top of that? This uh, heard quite often, and. Um, this was also one of the motivations why to bring over Kinetic functions to the core, and it's now the third pillar that Evans mentioned for Kinetic itself. And you have now the choice, and you have now a full-blown function as a service platform that you can run on Kubernetes on your own, but also on any of these offerings that you see the, here. And before we end up, and before we come to the, to the great uh, sessions that we have in, uh, for the rest of the day, let, let me try to give you some yeah, some look into the crystal ball. So but this is kind of my, actually it's not a really um, a prediction, it's more like a wish list for my, uh, of me. So what could be next and what I, th I think would be happen. So, but it, this is in context of container full serverless. So it's more about the overall picture. So as, um, as you've seen, WebAssembly will, is probably one of the most hottest technologies right out now for running code and starting up quickly because one of the, the biggest challenges that still Kinetic suffers is, uh, is cold start and WebAssembly really has some promise for that. Of course, this is kind of goes parallel to containers. So uh, Rasm also defines an own format for that. Then we have, uh, oops, oh. sorry. 
Then we have uh, what I would could see is really that the Kubernetes control plane itself could be based on a serverless model, especially if it um, for optional features of Kubernetes, so that you do not have to pay something for features that you are not using on Kubernetes itself. I think this would be a, a nice way to explore. Um, Sub-second cold start. This is really kind of the the dream that we all have somehow, but it's still not possible. So it's it's possible in certain cases, but uh, it's hard. Let's say like this. And finally, no, not finally, but scale to zero is a core Kubernetes feature. This would be also, of course, uh, I, I would say something we should uh, could strive for. And finally, I think that uh, hybrid serverless or so running serverless on multiple clusters with a single control plane that combines anything is one of the the hottest topics these days as well. And with that, I say thank you. And um, yeah, and so sorry for the, the audio issues and so. Thanks. Thank you, Roland.